All right, let's take authority over the gift of this day that God has given us in Jesus' name. Father, thank you. This is the day that you've made. We're rejoicing, we're glad in it. And Father God, we believe that we receive all the benefits, the blessings, and your holy word that you have for us today. Father God, to license us into our future, into this good future, your future plans that you've laid out for us. We believe we receive them in Jesus' name. Help us by your your precious Holy Spirit. Give us that help that we need, that extra help to learn and to understand and be able to comprehend the wonderful truth that you've set before us. We believe we receive it right now, all of it, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Oh, this is so good. We're moving on to Don't Give Up Part Two. Don't give up part two. Look, God is on your side. I hope you know that. I hope you realize that God is on your side. Don't give up. What dream have you buried out back? What desire have you abandoned in the muck of hopelessness because it made your heart too sick to even carry one more day? Jesus is the resurrection and the life. He restores. He raises up old, dry, dead bones and makes armies out of them. He turns heart-stopping failure into inspiring, confidence-building success. God takes what the world considers extremely weak and contemptible to absolutely confound the strong. God takes what the world considers foolish, intellectually beneath them, to confound the most wise. God actually laughs at his enemies. That's what his word says. That means he is having a huge laugh over your enemies because your enemies are his enemies. God loves you. He cares about your dreams, your desires. He hates evil and is ready to fight for your benefit. Just like he did for King Jehoshaphat. We read about that in part one in the people of Judah. We talked about it. So don't give up. God wants to fight for you. Don't give up. There was an American prisoner of war held in Vietnam, and he was described by his fellow soldiers as a strong and sure Marine's Marine. One day, he began to shuffle around the camp. He became increasingly disconnected from the world around him. Finally, he just laid down, he curled up on the ground, and he died. His last words were, wake me up when it's over. It doesn't matter how strong you are, how rich you are, how talented, gifted you are. If life becomes hopeless, and without God, that is the final destination hopelessness. You just cast off restraint. You just, you give up. You can't go on. Oh, don't you give up, my friend. Don't give up. Please don't give up. We're going to learn in this part two of don't give up that God has a vision for you and it's absolutely necessary to your life. He speaks through the desires he plants in your heart. When you delight yourself in him, he waters his big dreams. Yes, impossible dreams that require his supernatural working hand. But as much as he wants you to have the dream, listen to this. The reason that it will always require a time period is because it's absolutely imperative that God impart this phenomena called patience into each one of us. James 1 says it's only when we develop the virtue of patience that we become complete. So the goal, the dream might be a successful business, a ministry, or a life-saving medicine. But if you don't obtain patience in the process and only achieve the dream, then you likely, most likely, will self-destruct. Look at the empirical evidence for that as a proven reality here in this life. Entertainer after entertainer achieve star status to become what? Strange human beings that can't even hold a marriage together and generally display signs of mental illness, addictions. How about business moguls? They become titans of wealth, often to fall into this God complex and use their influence to rule over the poor with their green theology and social reform to further promote their control over the population. Or 
How about the intellects of the day? They award themselves the Nobel Peace Prize as they experiment on whole societies for the greater good and secretly take government grants that the families of the dead are forced to pay for through their own taxes. And it's all justifiable because, well, we're smarter than you and they don't need to be patient because, well, we're geniuses. You see, it's all part of that demonic lie that was sown into humanity thousands of years ago in the Garden of Eden. The serpent said this. He said, you don't have to listen to God. You don't need his wisdom. Just eat from this tree called knowledge. Just get the the knowledge of good and evil and, and you'll be like God. And we've been snacking on that fruit of stupidity from that day on. Knowledge cannot stand without the foundation of wisdom. It's like imposing a third floor build when you don't have the first floor. You don't have to be a builder or an architect to know that's just insanity. But this insanity is at the root of the cognitive dissonance many people are feeling torn apart by. They pursue knowledge without the principle of wisdom. And so they're engaged in this strange act of futility. They want to defeat the enemy without but be friends with the enemy within. So the deception they're living in becomes a mental war zone. They're pushing buttons on the elevator to to a lower level, but expecting it's gonna take them to a higher level. And when they keep sinking lower and lower and lower, they do like the strong soldier. They just curl up, lie down, and they just hope to die. Don't give up. My friend, don't give up. God is speaking this right into your soul right now. Don't give up. Trust me, the Lord says. God Almighty is telling you. He's saying, trust me. Trust in the Lord. John Leach, a visiting senior research fellow at the University of Portsmouth, he wrote in an article, he said, the term give up-itis was coined by a medical officer during the Korean War. They described it as a condition where a person develops extreme apathy, gives up hope, relinquishes the will to live, and dies, despite the lack of an obvious physical cause. The author included this account in his article. Listen to this. During World War II, when a cargo ship was torpedoed and sank in the North Sea, some of the crew managed to escape the sinking vessel. One survivor reported a curious incident that happened in their life raft. There were seven of us on the raft, but the third officer died about two hours before we were picked up. He was very despondent, and toward the end, he lost heart and gave up and died. What's the cure for this give up itis? What's the cure? I mentioned this verse right at the beginning of part one in this series, Don't Give Up. Listen to this, Proverbs 29, verse 18. Where there is no vision, no redemptive revelation of God, the people perish, but he who keeps the law of God, which includes that of man, blessed, happy, fortunate, enviable is he. Now let me read it in another version for you. This is the the New King James Version. This is kind of what I grew up on, this verse. Where there is no revelation, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. My friend, the cure for give up itis is a vision, a revelation of God, and that you can put your trust and hope in God. The redemptive revelation that he has a plan for you and that no matter how you feel right now, no matter how bad things look in this moment, no matter how bad they look, God is greater. He loves you and he's not willing that any, any should perish, but they all would come to life. Just like we read this in the story about King Jehoshaphat and the nation of Judah, God wants to fight your battles. This is the real bona fide cure to give up itis that obviously people die from. Let's read that key turnaround part where God answered Jehoshaphat's prayer in the crisis. Remember this story? Jehoshaphat and the the people of Judah, and this is the turnaround verse, 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verse 15. He said, God said, listen carefully, all you people. The Lord says this to you, be not afraid or dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours, but God's. 
You see, that's different thinking, isn't it? We all tend to think in one way or another that the battle is ours. Look, I got to do this. It's I got to do this. Me, I got to do this. It's all on me. Many sinners know they're in sin and would love to get out of their mess, but feel like it's their duty to clean themselves up. It's, it's what they need to do first before they can come to God. So they end up feeling utterly hopeless because ultimately they know they can't fix themselves. None of us can forgive ourselves of our own sins. None of us can set ourselves free from sin and bondage. That we all need God, but it's hopeless because they've got to be this sinless specimen before they even get to God to get his help. You see, that is the lie the enemy wants every one of us sinners to believe. It's stupid thinking, trying to fix stupid thinking. Albert Einstein once said this. He said, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we used when we created them. <laughs> Man, it took a genius to help us see that, right? Look here how God appeals to us in our broken state. Isaiah 1 verse 18. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be like wool. You see, the, we think the battle is ours. Jesus took on the battle to defeat sin because we didn't stand a chance against it. Jesus took on the battle to defeat sickness because we didn't stand a chance. God took on the ownership of our battles when we call him Abba Father. And we said, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. Oh, I've got to read to you 2 Chronicles 20, verse 15, again, just so that you can hear it again in the context of this. He said, listen carefully, all you people. The Lord says this to you, be not afraid or dismayed at this great multitude, for the battle is not yours. It's not yours, but God's. Are you in the way of God defeating your enemies? Are you in the way? Do you keep possessing the battle instead of possessing the promised land? Every time God tries to smite or destroy your enemy, are you in the way trying to put the devil in a feeble headlock? Get out of the way. You're called to praise and author God's will on earth, but not wrestle in the mud with the flesh and blood. Stop trying to sense and reason your arguments to get the upper hand. That will only keep you in a state of perpetual discouragement and distress. Submit to God. That's what James 4 verse 7 says. Submit to God, then resist the devil, and now he's running for the hills from you because he can't deal with your God of certain victory. Jesus has already defeated him at the cross. The devil needs you to step out of Christ's victory and get into the realm of your carnal thinking. Spiritual ignorance. 1 Peter 5 verse 8 says that the devil goes about like a roaring lion looking for whom he can devour. That's the weak, ignorant person who has no clue that God is his refuge, his fortress, his high tower, a perfect help in the time of trouble. God is always victorious. Why would you run if you're in Christ, if you're in him? You wouldn't. When you're behind the protective glass at the zoo, right? You don't run from the lion. It's only when you're not protected, not shielded from the animals that you run or try to run that you're in terror. If we trust in others or in ourselves, then we don't have that spiritual shield all around us. That's the dangerous life. That's the unprotected life. Jeremiah chapter 17 calls it the cursed life. Don't trust in man or yourself. Trust in the Lord. Trust in God. Don't give up. God is ready to fight for you, to be your legal counsel, to defend you here on earth. Don't give up. Pam and I often read this verse. I really like it. Psalm 35 verse 1. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Oh, oh, you've got the Lord on your side, my friend, so don't give up. But at the same time, be conscious of that truth and get out of the way. You follow him. You don't lead God, but God leads you. You follow, so don't give up. Look at Luke 
21, verse 15, Jesus says this. He said, for I myself will give you a mouth with such words and wisdom that none of your foes or opponents will be able to resist or contradict. Oh my goodness. Did you hear that? Jesus himself is giving you words, wisdom that none of your opponents can resist or contradict. Don't give up. Oh, not now. Don't give up. That, that doesn't mean that you won't have foes or enemies or opponents because you will. If you're going to succeed at anything, it means you will have opposition. But be of good cheer. Jesus, the King, is your Savior. This, this ain't his first rodeo, if you know what I mean. He's an expert at winning. Don't give up, but rather look up, trusting God who made heaven and earth. He's got this. God's got this. But get behind the spiritual glass of favor, behind his shield, behind the wall of truth. Now, let me give you a few practical steps to work your don't give upness. Okay, let me just give you a few practical steps. Number one, you got to know the objective, decide your purpose. Know the objective, decide your purpose. There's an old parable of three bricklayers. Each are asked what they're doing. The first says, Well, I'm laying bricks. The second says, I'm building a church. The third answered, I'm building the house of God. The first has a job, the second has a career, and the third, the third has a calling. Think of this. It's common to give up on a job. It's far less common to give up on a career. And it's very uncommon to give up on a calling, a true calling. You must know the objective and decide your purpose in the matter at hand with God's help. You need God's help in this. Can you imagine playing football but not knowing the goal? Oh, you just run. Which way? Well, who cares? Run for what? With what? And why? Oh, just have fun and run. Go ahead. You see, that, my friend, is why so many good people, they just give up on life. They don't truly know the objective. So their purpose is unintentional. Is the objective indulgence, sacrifice, fame, wealth, altruism, or any kind of just feel-good win? What's the real objective to life? Which bricklayer are you? Only you can decide for yourself if you'll acknowledge your maker's, the maker's plan and true purpose for your life, your design. You see, you decide that. Don't give up practical step number one. Know the objective and decide your purpose with God's help. Number two, encourage yourself in the Lord. Yes, God will fight for you, but you've got to do your part. Encourage yourself in the Lord. Quit going over and over the loss, the offense, the trauma. There's no good or profit in that. You can sing gloom and despair and agony on me, but it won't fix the problem or encourage you. Sure, you've got enemies. You may even have some good people right now that are thinking about stoning you. Like David, remember the psalmist did. But encourage yourself in the Lord. Maybe your friend isn't calling you back or responding to your apology. Encourage yourself in the Lord. How? Start saying what the Lord says about you. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. How about this one? No weapon formed against me shall prosper. And oh, I like this one. God has thoughts and plans for me for peace and blessing, not destruction, but to give me a future and a hope. The famous Jeremiah 29, 11, right? Or how about something so fundamental to being a child of God? God so loves me that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus, so that I would have eternal life. Praise God. You know, that's got me encouraged, just saying those eternal truths. Encourage yourself in the Lord. What are you waiting for? Another sad song to identify with? Chasing sympathy will not get your stuff back, your wife, your kids back, your dog, and the burned down house. Psalm 34 verse 8 says, taste and see that the Lord is good. You do that. You taste and see that the Lord is good. Don't be one of those people that delegates their spiritual tasting to a ministry. Well, would, would you guys just taste for me there? There's nothing wrong with being encouraged by someone else, but at some point you've got to self-feed. At some point, you've got to own the decision to trust in the Lord for yourself. Babies get fed, but we all know that at some point it's expected that a sign of a healthy growth in a person is that they can feed themselves. So don't give up. Step number two, encourage yourself in the Lord. You can do this. And number three, you have got to work the vision. 
Oh, emptiness talks and it sounds like sadness. Fullness talks and it sounds like gladness. Empty wants to give up. Full wants to go up. It's not enough to be healed. That's great. But what are you healed for? For life, for love, for giving and helping and encouraging others. That's working the vision. You work the vision. You work the vision for the future to go up or the law of sin and death will keep pulling you down, down, and down. I'm going to keep on saying this. Your repetition determines your persuasion. If you keep repeating that it's hopeless, then you will have a decided belief that it is hopeless. God cannot contradict your choice for death and cursing. He's given you the power of choice so that you have the lawful right to reject truth if that's what you want to do. How can you reject His hope, His great plans for your life, His promises for you, His provision, and not feel like giving up? You might say, well, I don't want to do that. But if you're constantly repeating bad information, ungodly thinking, ungodly teaching, and lies from the devil, then you've decided your repetition. Again, your repetition determines your persuasion. If you repeat lies that contradict truth and God's word, well, guess what? You get the distortion of the lies and not the truth. You must work the vision that is inspired by God's truth, not your feelings, the Bible, not culture, God's absolutes, the words of Jesus, not some intellectual progressive that puts all of his faith in an unprovable genome leap of evolution from an ape to his Uncle Bob. That's not science. That's fantasy that even Darwin's theory concluded had a kill switch disputing its validity. Wake up and work the vision that God gives you. If you see yourself as losing, you'll always lose. If you see yourself as failing, you'll always fail, even when you're winning. If you see yourself as God's child with his favor and grace, then you will live in that reality behind that beautiful glass. And even when trials and temptations come against you, you can say, I'm not going to give up. Don't ever give up. See, believe it, receive it. See it, believe it, receive it. That's how faith works. You don't like that? You're not, you don't like that principle? Well, you must learn to get over your offense with God's way and learn to love it. Farmers, they do it all day long. They work the vision of the seed by planting it. They believe in the outcome of the seed. They receive the harvest of the seed. They get, so now you and I can get a little spiritual agriculture in our believing so that we can start seeing and seeing because we're believing and believing. Don't give up. Step number three, you have got to work the vision. Now, I do have one more don't give up step for you, but this one is such a shocker that I'm going to need to give it to you in part three. It's going to need a little explanation, a little bit more time. So I'm going to give it to you in part three. You don't want to miss part three because this is essential truth from God's word on practically how to set yourself up for a don't give up life. And let's face it, giving up has tragically become far too common in our world in our society, but it's not for you. My friend, it's not for you. God does not want you to give up. You know, Revelation 21 verse five says, I will make all things new. I make all things new. You might ask, well, who does that? It says the one seated on the throne in heaven. That's Jesus, the King of Kings. You've been feeling like the past is the past, so what's the use? Pastor Stephen, the, it's just, it happened, the past is, I, I've made a mess and here I am, what's the use? But Jesus makes all things new and it doesn't matter how old you are. God's mercies are new every morning. Don't give up. The enemy wants you to give up, but I'm telling you, don't give up. This don't give up message is from God just for you. He dearly loves his children and he doesn't want you buying into the lie that it's hopeless and and, and just to surrender your will and give up. No, God doesn't want you diseased with give up-itis. If you don't know Jesus as your personal savior, you can ask him into your heart right now. Jesus is the cure to all the hopelessness, the despair, the emptiness. He's He's the cure to a broken 
shattered heart. Let Jesus in right now. Pray this after me. Dear Lord Jesus, I need you now. Come into my heart. You're the Son of God. You died on the cross for me, rose up from the grave. Now you're seated on the throne of heaven. Forgive me of all my sins. Help me to live for you. Help me not to give up. Fill me with your spirit. Give me your hope and strength. All in your name, I pray. Amen. Thank you for sharing this very important time with us. We pray and believe that God's word is guiding your life and your future from this moment on. Thank you for your generous support. Together, we're getting God's good news to others. Sign up today for the free Today's Life Talk, an encouraging gift from Pastor Stephen. He sends directly to your email. At Living Room Church, you are loved, and we pray blessings on you. Remember, Jesus is Lord, and in Him, we can live life strong.